Hi there everyone, I'd like to introduce you to Chris Berry, who actually is a member of my local tennis club. We don't play against each other because he's too good, but we were talking one day <laughs> after tennis, and it turns out that Chris's job is not professional tennis player, he's actually a collector and dealer of maps and signs and posters and things like that. And one thing he's particularly interested in, that I'm a little bit fascinated by too, is the underground, the tube map of London. And when I found out he had a bunch of this stuff here in his collection, you know what was going to happen next, and here we are. Well, you're not allowed to call it a collection anymore because I'm now a dealer, so I'm not actually allowed to keep anything that um, I have, which is the hard part of the job. Temporary collection. <laughs> yeah, temporary collection. But right. no, I got into this about 15 years ago when my mum showed me uh, an old map of the British Empire exhibition, and on it had this incredible ornate representation of the underground. And it was stunning. And ever since I saw that map, I looked at other maps, and I found that there was actually a very decorative period. It's quite hard to imagine that the tube map could have been decorative, but it certainly was back in the 1920s. And so I just got into the history of it, and I quickly discovered that there was a, a, also a big market out there. Pardon the pun, but there's a wonderful linear history to this topic and the, the designs vary massively, but they also tell the story of London in the early 20th century. As you go through the 20th century, you have famous designers and artists who are involved in the designing of it. But you could also identify some of the big events within London through the maps and how they differ. Well, funny you should mention linear history because that's what we're going to do today. There's all sorts of maps and signs coming and going through through yeah. Chris's place here. So we, we can deal with what we've got today and we're going to look at it in a chronological order. We figured that might be the best way to yeah. do it, to start with the older stuff. The oldest thing I've got here today is a Victorian map of the District Railway. Now, in 1863, the Metropolitan Railway was built. It was the first underground railway in London. In fact, it was the first underground railway in the world. And then following that, in 1868, the District Railway was built. But it wasn't until about 15 years after opening, did they start to produce maps, believe it or not, because the, the lines were so simple, no one really needed a map. But as things got more complicated, and in the 1870s and 80s, this one's an 1890s version, they produced these rather big maps. So imagine you're a Victorian gentleman, and you're trying to navigate yourself. Try and open it out and see how nice and convenient it is. Okay, so, oh, I'm in a hurry. I need to meet my, my friend at the smoking club. <laughs> uh, let me quickly check where I'm going. So you've got another Victorian gentleman to help you, so you're quite lucky. Whoa, <clears throat> so there we go. I was not expecting that. That was your tube map back in 1890. It was this big from about 1870s onwards. Fortunately, they did produce a miniature version as well, but those were nearly always issued in guidebooks and stuff. So if you were coming to London as a holiday maker, this is what you'd have to contend with. I guess it has the bonus of not just showing you the train lines, but also the streets. So if you had to go somewhere a bit more granular, you could do it. That's right. And as yeah. the underground becomes more complicated, as we'll see, the background detail, as designers design it, seems to drop away, which is fortunate because there is so busy. And what you find is that one railway company, like the District Railway Company, was a different company to the Metropolitan Railway. So they put their line more prominently and left everyone thinner. That's the red one. Yeah, the thick red one. And then everything else, including the Metropolitan Railway, which is also red, runs along there. And you'll notice at this point there's there's no other tube lines in red on this map. Okay, let's fold this so, yeah. one up. I'll let you do the folding. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I think the most important part of the story is through the 1890s and through the 1900s, five deep level tube lines opened. This was a huge period of development, but each of those were separate railway companies. Each of them issued their own maps and they acted as if they were competitors to one another, which was crazy. But if you were to try and navigate across London, you'd probably have to ride three or four different lines. Each of them would require a different map. An example of that is the Central London Railway. This is one of the competing... Yeah, this was the fourth underground railway and this was also a deep level tube. The first two were just trenches that were just, they dug a great big hole in London, put a railway in and covered it up. Whereas in the early 1900s, they started tunneling. This is a central London railway. Okay, let's have a look. So this is their map. And again, it runs from the bank all the way to Shepherd's Bush, but there's almost no reference to any other underground railway, even though there were three others at this time. So this <laughs> is from 1902. It very much has a feeling that the train line map isn't really integrated. It's almost plopped on top of a street map. It doesn't, it doesn't right. feel seamless yet. It just feel, it, they feel like two things on top of each other. Well, the process of drawing a map up was all done on lithographic stones. So it would have been quite laborious to, to create the background detail, especially for a railway map. So they would use the existing background detail from an ordnance survey map, for example. But they would always use some kind of thick coloured line to try and differentiate themselves from 
the background detail that was going on. All right. And in a similar vein, at that same sort of time, the district railway, which I just showed you, were producing their own pocket map. So you have to carry these things around with you. You know, If you wanted to travel around London, you need the district railway map, which does have a few different lines on it. They were a bit more generous in showing how the rest of it interacted. This one was from 1907. You can imagine, it wasn't a great time for the Underground Railways in around 1908. They were struggling financially. They were all trying to operate independently of one another and they, they weren't getting the passenger numbers that they wanted. And it took a, a man called Frank Pick, who was then the commercial or the publicity manager of a consortium of Underground Railways. And he brought all the railway companies together and said, look, this is mad. Why are we trying to compete? Why are we issuing our separate maps? Why are we doing separate marketing? We are ultimately all one system and we're not competitors, we complement each other. Mm. So in 1908 they agreed to present themselves under one brand and using one map. So this is the first map that brought all the lines together. It was also the first map to attribute colours to each of the lines. Which now we take for granted. In fact yeah. most people will say oh you get the red line or the black line. And, that's right and, and that's, a few of the colours have survived. They've changed over the period but for example the Bakerloo line here is brown as it is today. The, the district railway line is green like it is today. So although there has been an awful lot of change in the colours there's a couple that have stayed consistent. A few of the key things to mention here are the fact that this is the first appearance of the underground word mark, the logo, that was agreed upon by all the railway companies that they will operate under this logo. Over the course of the next 10 years or so, that would become part of the roundel, which we call today. So a red disc was put behind that, and that was where the logo was created. Although it's not dated, you can tell it's from the 1908 period because the Franco-British exhibition was taking place in 1908. That's a tell. There are a few variants of this okay. and you can date them based on small things like that. Of course, the tube map as we know it today doesn't really reflect the actual route of the lines. It's become schematic. Here it looks a lot more like a big bowl of spaghetti. Yeah. It looks like what the, the tracks are really doing, but yeah. not entirely, you told me. Not entirely. The designer had to put the reference box somewhere, for example. So even this early, geography was being somewhat sacrificed in order to enable clarity. So for example, the Metropolitan Line here actually curves right through the middle, but they've just ignored that and they've done that. And actually, passengers don't seem to be that bothered about geographical accuracy, even in these days. There we go. Yeah, so the first unified map of the underground. Is this rare, this thing I'm holding? Or? They're fairly rare, yeah, and they're highly collectible. A lot of people collect from this point onwards because they see this as the first underground map as opposed to all the separate London railway companies. All right, so the next thing we're going to look at, I'm very excited about, it's this monster behind us here. This is fantastic. It's like some kind of Harry Potter thing. What have we got here? I've got two pieces here. This is the first one, which is the Wonderground Map of London Town by Macdonald Gill. This is a super rare map. This was issued later in 1924 and 1928 as smaller maps, but this is an original 1914 edition. And this was produced because Frank Pick, who I've already mentioned, he's the commercial manager of the London Underground. He was a transformational guy who brought the lines together, came up with the word mark, engaged some of the best artists of the era to create commercial posters. He turned posters into something that all artists wanted to do. So he commissioned a man called Macdonald Gill. He was an architect, he was a sculptor, he designed typefaces. His brother Eric Gill was a sculptor and a famous artist as well with a slightly dubious past. And he also worked under Edward Johnson, who I'll mention later, who designed the font of the underground. Macdonald Gill is most famous for pictorial maps. Pictorial maps being maps that have pictures basically that form their image. And mm. He was approached by Frank Pick to create a poster that generated excitement among passengers and present the underground network as something that could be used to access London for fun. When this poster went up, it was so popular, people lost themselves in it. In every little part of this, there are quotes, there are historic references, there are characters. And what happened was these things went up in stations all over London and they caused nightmares. In fact, on the passenger flow was terrible. People would stand there, look at it, they'd miss their train, they would cause blockages. But it's considered to be a poster that saved the underground because back in 1913, 14, they were having a really tough time financially in terms of their reputation. And it made people relate differently to this thing that they were suddenly being told they were very lucky to have. They're being told on this title here by paying us your pennies, you go about your business. I love this map. It doesn't strike me as much of a train map though. I don't even see train lines. No, but what they do have are all the underground stations designed in a really ornate way. So that you can see the stations, these kind of reddy orange buildings. They're disproportionately prominent they on are. the map. Yeah, but if you're talking about accuracy, I don't remember there being a giant snake in, the, in Hyde Park either, but it's a quite a self-indulgent map. You know, McDonald Gill went to town, literally, and people loved it. 
All right. Well, where do we yes. go next in our story of the evolution no of worries. underground maps? So this design carried on in various formats, and here are some of the later formats. They're all folded up nicely into pocket format. Okay. So it's a little bit better than the, uh, the district railway map. This is just one example of the variation. Still that kind of spaghetti design. This is really unclear. This is not a great one in terms of clarity. Mm. But they did start to experiment with the underground Ooh. webmark and mm. they started doing it vertically because they started putting them up on stations vertically. Because okay. it's just too long to stick out of the wall, right? So they used to create these vertical ones and so they wanted to reflect that. And this is around 1913 as well. So we then go on to a period which is probably my favourite period. Macdonald Gill again, he was commissioned to um, design the underground map, the pocket map, and I thought that was quite brave seeing as that's his form. This is the map that was issued and designed by Macdonald Gill. And you'll notice now that the, the Randall is looking very much like the one we have today. Yeah, there's the famous red circle that anyone who's been to London will associate with tube stations and things yeah. like that. It's iconic. That's right, and this was actually introduced just a couple of years before this map was issued. And the font has been introduced and actually designed by Edward Johnston for the underground. So again, Frank Pick saw an important thing to do was to create a font that defined the underground. And Frank Pick was very much driven around the branding and the commercial appearance being not just a decorative thing, but being a, a very important device to generate recognition and public buy-in to the underground. The reason the red disc came in originally was because every station had so many adverts all over the platform that the only way you could tell what station you were at was to look for the station name, but you, you, it was lost in the advertising. So they put a massive red disc behind the station name and then suddenly from the train window you could find quickly the name of the station. It's not that different um, today really. No, so all the stations had them and then suddenly that red disc then moved to being the signature of the underground logo. We're now into 1923 and luckily Macdonald Gill didn't go into quite as much detail. In fact, he went completely the other way. So not only did Macdonald Gill take away the background detail, he even took away the River Thames. So this map here is the lines floating in space. So yeah. a lot of the lines have retained their colours but he's used calligraphy for the stations, which I love. There's an ornate border. It's a really decorative map, and this defined the period, really, of early 1920s decorative mapping. Not super easy to read, that typeface, but... Yeah, okay. No, they still haven't quite cracked the clarity issue, even yeah. with all the background detail gone, even with the River Thames gone. In fact, although modernists and designers love to just put in the information that you need, arguably the Thames is probably the most important orientation device. These red dots here are for the British Empire exhibition, which took place in 1924. Right. So they're just telling people where to alight for that. Again, we're still quite realistic though with the shape and line of the lines it's yeah. a real it's a real bowl of spaghetti it's, that's about to change soon it is yeah. it is you can feel it coming can't you yes <laughs> this one's my favorite map of all of them so you have to give me some I, time for I, this. I feel like maybe you say that a lot in fact no, this one's my in favorite. fact you know we talked about collection yeah this is actually in my collection okay this is a never sell because this not is, for sale i found this in the back of a um an american american's guide to london and it had never been opened and I've only opened it once. So this is the second time it's been opened, right? Whoa. Um, and this is a really unusual map. This was designed for the tourist market. Yeah. They published them, put them in guidebooks, and they were sent all over the world. This is from 1928. It's by a guy called Edgar Perman. And you'll see why it's my favorite map in a minute, because it makes Macdonald Gill's map look boring. Oh yeah, that is nice. So it's the only underground map that was issued in portrait orientation. That's a nerdy fact for you. But it's the fact they've got the balance between the background detail and the various features of London. The River Thames is even nicely rendered. I can't stop looking at that elephant at the yeah. zoo. <laughs> That's all I can look at. And you can see, if you look really closely, you'll see numbers everywhere. And they're all places to visit. Theatres, parks. Uh, I love the little boat on the Thames as well. It's yeah. Nice, near the docks. Again, it's very ornate. It's, they've used a highly italicised font and it just looks great. It's also because it is a really nice size it frames really well too so for me if you were to if you were selling to someone that didn't really know much about the london underground they weren't out to try and collect every single one but just wanted one piece this would be the one that i would probably recommend nice it's really nice very nice all right so that's 1928 meanwhile the people who were actually in london and traveling around london were still trying to decipher the underground and what happened was that from 1925 to 1932 these little maps were issued so that was 1927 and it's really small so what we've seen here is the move towards really small pocket maps you can open it here i go and it's based on linen card so really oh, yeah. robust card yeah, it's got a nice sort of sturdiness to it this one but yeah. it's small right yeah so. <laughs> it, it is small this man's 
called Fred Stingmore. And once again, he has grappled with geography. And his solution has been to use little boxes to tell you where all the lines end up going because he's only been able to fit the central area oh, okay, yeah. into the map. Yeah, I've got those boxes saying what you could have seen if this map was bigger. Exactly. It's cluttered, it's hard to read, it's hard to tell which station applies to which blob. Although it's a really fine effort, they're getting better and better. The guy that was sitting next to Fred Stingmore was ultimately the guy that managed to solve the problem. Right. Fred Stingmore worked in the drawing office at the London Underground. So too did a man called Henry Charles Beck, or Harry Beck as some people know him. And that's really where the transformation came. If you've heard of anyone to do with tube maps, it'll be Harry Beck because he's the guy that change the game. He is, and he was a fairly junior draftsman, even though he'd been there for quite a while. He worked closely with the drawing office, including Fred Stidgemore, who he considered to be a friend. And he, in his own time, using the experience he had in the signalling office and drawing electrical diagrams, realised he had the answer. So, unfortunately, this is not an original. OK. This is held in the London Transport Museum. So this is just a copy, just for the purposes of today, but this is his hand-drawn presentation drawing that he did in order to present his idea. Okay. to the board. And you can see, even just then, this is in 1931, that what we understand now of the underground has been born. All the curves and the spaghetti and all the craziness has gone and it's become more a rough idea of how to get around. Yeah, so what he realised was that actually geographical accuracy didn't matter as much as allowing passengers to know what station is coming next, which station to get off at, which lines intersect with that station. So all of that was far more important than actually what was going on above ground. He abandoned the geographical um, constraints that all of his predecessors suffered and realised that he could actually get nearly all the network on it. So what he did was he expanded the central area to make it much bigger and he compressed the outer areas, meaning that all the, the spacing between the stations was the same. And using geometrical principles which were horizontals, verticals and 45 degree, he was able to create a diagram that has lasted the test of time. And, and although it's become a design that people like the look of, the test of any good design is whether it's fit for purpose. Well, he presented this to the board and they said no. Right. <laughs> they went, no, I'm sorry, it's too radical. People won't understand it. This is not the right time. Um, but Fred Stingmore encouraged him. He did a couple more tweaks and drafts and, and only because of Beck's persistence did they actually change their mind and went, you know what, we're going to run it. I can see why they would feel that way. It, like, yeah. like now it seems like the obvious thing to do, but I can easily put myself in their position and think, you can't make a map that doesn't like show reality. Like I can see how some yeah. people would be like, oh, I don't know, I don't know about this. This is the first issue of that map. So this was issued in January 1933. So it took a while for them to come around to actually getting it printed. You can see that they were slightly apprehensive because on the front cover, a new design for an old map. We should welcome your comments. Please write to the publicity manager. They're kind of almost covering yeah. their butts a bit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That print code basically tells you that they actually made 750,000 of these. So although they were nervous, I think they, they felt fairly confident that this was going to be a hit. And that bit is the date, so that's January 1933. May I? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. So this is a really fine example. We were lucky yeah. because we do get these in and they don't last long. They, they do sell quickly. Yeah. And we were really lucky to have what is the finest example I've ever owned. I mean, it looks like it's come straight off the printing press and I promise you it hasn't no. come off my inkjet printer. I mean, so many things have changed now, but also it's so familiar, you know, it does look like what we have now. Yeah. It does. And it's fit for purpose and it is proven through time. Harry Beck was then responsible for designing the map for the next 30 years. All of that was based on a, a verbal agreement he had with the underground that he was the chief designer, that any design edits were done by him. So this is arguably one of the most important pieces of information design globally because it not only transforms the way that people map transit systems, in many ways it has changed the way people represent information, mm. realising that they should ask themselves well, what really matters and removing anything else that doesn't. So as I mentioned, Harry Beck was the designer for 30 years, but he did have some competition. At one point, he came across a pocket map in 1938, this is a 1939 version, that wasn't his hand. Uh -huh. and he wasn't made aware. It just suddenly issued at stations and it was this one. So this is like some pirate copy. Yeah, unbeknownst to Harry Beck, a man called Hans Schlager, who goes by the designer name Zero, was asked to see if he could make some tweaks to the map and he's made the interchange stations more pronounced, he's made the lines thinner. They've also introduced some of the proposed extensions over here, which actually some of those never happened because of the war. 
because this is 1939 now, so for example the extension to Alexandra Palace, some of these extensions are referred to Northern Heights extensions that never happened. And he also, he's put in a, a central area colour scheme where it's white and then he's, he's done this wonderful airbrush design which has shown the Thames in a sort of negative, it's a lovely design, but Beck was furious when he saw it because he had been told he was the chief designer of this map. Mm, so nice. this was the first attempt at his reign, but it wasn't long before Harry Beck came back with a couple of quite wacky designs, but this is just one we have from 1945, so there wasn't much in the way of World War II underground maps as you can imagine but this is where the London Transport Executive Board start meddling and they said if a station serves two lines we want the station name put there twice in two different colours so the duplication was unbelievable yeah. and you can see how busy some of these stations are. It's very text heavy isn't it? Yeah. It is yeah so he had to fulfill some of these obligations that he was asked to do but ultimately he was back as designer he was happy until about 1959 when the relationship ended rather sourly. That's a whole other story. We'll yeah. tell you another day, people. <laughs> but that's, that's quite involved. But, that's right. but Harry Beck's like legacy endures. Just to remind people, we'll put on screen right now what the modern tube map looks like. Not that different. Like you know, still you know, no. forever being improved and changed, but not that not that different. But to include the Elizabeth line now as well. So that was another whole job to to redesign the map to incorporate that. One last thing though, it's an elephant in the room because it's right behind us. <laughs> it's about as big as an elephant. This is a, this is a recent acquisition for you. That's what, are, right. what are we looking at here? Well, this weighs about 70 kilos. It's an enamel map. It's made out of rolled iron with an enamel yeah, coating. Yes, so it feels that so cold. It's, it's a very, very heavy enamel yeah. sign, basically. These were put out outside stations. So this would be hanging on the wall outside the station as I was going in, like you have in the modern train stations. That's right. Yeah, it's amazing they used to make them out of enamel because this is 1933. So while this was in situ, Harry Beck's map was being circulated. So you had this diagram in people's hands, but you still had the whole spaghetti uh, geographical map on the walls. It took a bit of time for the transition to happen. As beautiful as that is, it does have this wear and tear. Patina. Patina. Authenticity. What does someone in your position do about that? Do you accept well, that as an occupational hazard? Or? You accept it largely. There are people out there, incredibly skilled craftspeople, who can bring, for example, this patch back to life. They apply a very similar enamel that was used back then and with a very steady hand and the right type of paints you can just bring these things back to life and it's incredible you would not know it when you see it as well but it's a it's a wonderful piece it weighs an absolute ton yeah and they are exceptionally rare and we're thrilled to have it thank you so much for showing us all this i know you collect so many other things we'll put a link to chris's website in the description you can go and see all the other stuff he he collects, accumulates, sells and buys. It's, it's all really interesting. But I really wanted to see underground maps and you have definitely delivered the goods. Thank you. <laughs> this is proper exciting now. We're going all the way up to the roof. This is somewhere you definitely don't normally see. Watch your step, everyone. Yeah, watch your watch step. This is amazing. Where are we now, Liz? What are we looking at? You are up in the roof of the Royal Albert Hall. This is a place where no one gets to go apart from our staff. And us. And us. <laughs> <laughs> what we're standing on is the ceiling that you see when you're inside the auditorium. 